Yeah, thanks. Uh, that is quite a crowd, which is amazing. Um, just a quick show of hands so that I know you as an audience. Who is here because of the nerdy part and who is here because of the coding standards part of the title? So the, the, ner the nerdy... <laughs> OK, OK. Um, so this will be about, does it does not work? OK, if I turn it on, turn it on and it works. So the coding standards. Um, a very shallow introduction. So what is a coding standard? What are coding standards? So um, basically, a coding standard or the coding standards are rules and guidelines uh, made up by someone for now. Um, for a programming language or some other context. Um, it becomes a standard if this rule set has been accepted by a large group of people, for example. Um, so some terminology, we do have coding standards. Um, as I said now, coding standards are an accepted set of rules. What happens if they are not accepted? Well, then. You can call them coding conventions. It's just rules. Some people follow them. You can make up your own coding conventions. And if um, yeah, a lot of people think this is cool, then this will eventually become a standard. Um, coding conventions can be about code style, which is just the formatting, so the visual look of your code. Um, it can be about best practices, so this is like Lots of people tried things in different ways, and this pro has proven to be the best way, or one of the best ways. Uh, it could be conventions about naming. How do you name functions? How do you name classes? How do you name variables, uh, files? How do you structure your code base, and things like that? Uh, it could be about commenting. Do you comment or not, because um, your code is self-explanatory? What do you comment? Um, is it um, just? Yeah, the, the technical part, so is it really documentation and things like that, and lots of other things. So who defines code, coding standards? Um, it could be the inventors of a programming language. So for example, Go is a pretty new language. Uh, it, it was introduced directly with a, si a set of standards. It was introduced with certain ways that you write Go code, for example, um, Go is automatically tested if you do it the way um, they tell you how to do it. Um, it could be some company deciding for rule sets and then yeah, they're making that a standard. So for example, um, the, the Zend framework standards. Um, this is specific to that framework, but the, um, the company still made it up. It could be a community. So for example, the WordPress coding standards uh, are a group effort of the WordPress community. Um, but actually, it could be any large enough group. So if you have a large enough fraction of a group in some context, it could be even, um, I don't know, a specific tool in one language, in one technology, tech, techno, tech field. So uh, th there could exist a coding standard just for that. Um, now, when you see there is something, one of the questions is, why is it there, and uh, why should I care? So why use coding standards? Um, the most obvious thing is, if you have something that follows standards, it's easier to understand. So in code, code is written, you can read it more easily. Why is that? Because it's consistent. So you have rules to follow, and um, yeah, if everyone who is involved in, um, yeah, um, developing the project and continuing the project and um, adding things follows the same set of rules, then the code base is consistent. Um, another thing is, because you can easier understand it, you can easier maintain it. Like, there is a bug. Uh, it's way less time spent on trying to figure out what you're reading, if you're reading the right part of your code base or whatever, because you just understand it. Every file is following the same set of rules, is made up in a similar fashion, uh, so you really spend your time chasing down a problem, finding the root of a problem, the cause of a problem. Um, there are also standards in, the term, in terms of security. So if you follow security standards, your code uh, becomes secure or more secure. Um, and also, consistency and readability and 
secureness and uh, all, all these um, quality things, of course, yeah, improve the overall code quality. Um, there is the saying, rules are meant to be broken. I don't think this is right, because, because you can understand it like some people just make up rules so that other people can break them and will break them. I think it's more like um, rules are there, and if you make something a rule and you follow or want to follow a rule, it makes total sense, but there should be room for exceptions. So uh, one funny aside, um, I'm living in a flat, in a house, in a house block that is all maintained by one property management um, company, and we have a caretaker. And we have a garage uh, under the houses, and um, yeah, so the caretaker one, uh, one day came to me and um, yeah, um, talked to me, so um, you know you have stuff on your parking lot, and um, this, is, this is not allowed. Um, I have to warn you, and you have to move it away, and if not, um, I have to fine you, and so on. And I was thinking about what is he talking about? Um, and yeah, I went down with him, and had a look, had a look at him. So, uh, are you serious? What's the reason? Yeah, you have stuff here. Um, if a fire breaks out, it could burn and so on. And this was what was on the parking lot. <laughs> so there was this rule: there has to be nothing but vehicles on the parking lot, which is not true for a six-track of water. But um, I don't think this will catch fire or so. But yeah. Okay. So we had coding standards in general. Now the context of the switch to WordPress. Um, are there WordPress-related, WordPress-specific coding standards? Yes, there are. Um, they live on make, WordPress.org. Uh, what are they about? So we have PHP coding standards because most of the code base is PHP. Even though we have Calypso, Gutenberg, and things like that, PHP is the base of the WordPress code, the software. Of course, we also have JavaScript. So there are JavaScript-specific coding standards. Then there's still HTML, because WordPress is yeah, used to serve web sites um, or web pages. And then, of course, we style our web pages. We have CSS-specific things. And also, um, the, the handbook lists accessibility um, coding standards. I don't think the structure of so putting these things in there as a coding standard is right. Um, because they somehow relate to HTML. Other standards here relate to JavaScript. They all make total sense, but it's not really a standard to follow in that terms, because the other things are like, it's a standard in one programming language or web technology. But of course, they are um, standards, um, and maybe it's, it's, it had been done this way to make more people aware of these specific things, which might be overlooked in one tiny thing as a, in the HTML side or so. Um, the PHP coding standards, what do they include? So for example, one rule of the standard is in WordPress we have to use tabs and not spaces. Uh, we use else if and not else space if. Or we um, space things, uh, so, no, um, we um, use underscores for example. Here's a code example. Then we have JavaScript coding standards, so we um, don't want to have space at the end of lines, and which also means in blank lines. Um, we quote our strings in single quotes, and we space things out. So we have white space um, around arguments, around um, uh, array keys, and or object keys, and so on. Um, HTML coding standards, so we have HTML text, we have attributes names, and they all has to have to be written in lowercase. Um, always quote attributes. Or um, if we have self-closing text, we, uh, do a, we put a space in here, which is follow um, the mantra, space things out. Um, CSS coding standards, um, we have attribute selectors, um, and we have quotes around values in, like if you have input type whatever, you have to quote that. Um, properties, we have a colon and then a space and things like that. So um, some of them are um, formatting, like the style, code style specific. Some of them are um, naming conventions. Some of them are just best practices for whatever reason. It's not always justified why you should do this. Sometimes it's just obvious. Sometimes it's just a decision and you could have done it differently. And now we made this decision, we follow them, so we have consistent code. OK, so how do you get started? Um, one easy thing to do is this. 
Who here knows about the editor config project of Fire? Wow, okay. No, nobody? One? Two? Okay. Um, what is it? So basically, if you have a project somewhere, you can put in this file, so a file with a dot editor config file name, and inside um, you have, um, yeah, you, you can use one or more of a certain set of um, rules or um, attributes or properties, and you define for your editor or your IDE um, how certain things should be uh, treated, saved, and whatever. So um, basically, this can be used with different editors and IDEs. Some of them just understand it out of the box. For others, there are plugins. Um, maybe if you are using some whatever custom-made IDE or so, um, you have to integrate it yourself. Um, so what do we have? So this is the full set of the um, properties that every IDE and editor currently out there understands. So what you can do is you can say, um, my indent style is space or is tab. My indent size is four spaces. So if you visually have your tab, it should be four spaces. If you use spaces, then one indenting means four spaces. Um, your end of line, your char set, UTF-8, and so on. And then there's also the max line length, which is not understood by all of the editors currently. Um, this is an example editor config file. Um, the root true here means just um, I don't care about any other um, files that you might find here in my project. This is the root. So don't bubble up and try to find something else. Um, in brackets, you have either a wildcard or just a string of a file name or a wildcard or a pattern or whatever for um, file names. And after that, you have the property definitions. So basically, this means whatever file you have, uh, we use tabs. The end of line is Linux style, and so on. And later on, you can specify different file names or patterns again, and either redo or redefine things that you defined uh, before, or define them because um, yeah, it's just it just makes sense for this. So for example. Um, JSON files or the RC, which is a config file, EaseLint RC, for example, or YAML files, uh, we don't indent with a tab. We use spaces, and we use two spaces uh, to indent them. So in this case, the indent style gets overridden. It was defined here as a tab, and the indent size was not defined at all. Or, yeah, it was not. And then uh, we have Markdown files, um, markdown, yeah, trailing spaces are needed if you want to do a simple line break without a paragraph um, skip between. So we don't want to trim um, white space on markdown files. A second thing that you can use is if you uh, happen to use Git as your versioning uh, system for your code base, you can make use of a file named git attributes. Um, git attributes is mainly about configuring or um, yeah, um, defining some kind of configuration, some attributes for paths. And uh, this means um, just folders or files in your project. But there are certain things that you can do um, which yeah, um, have a relation or are actually part of coding standards. So um, how this works is, again, you have a pattern. The first one says, whatever it is, uh, I want to treat it as a text file. And then the um, line ending should be Linux style. And then you can specify, OK, but if I happen to have JPEG or um, PNG files, they are binary files. And then also, I just included here um, other things. So the export ignore, for example, um, just to show there are other things that you can put in a git attributes file. And to make sure if you understand, hey, this is the file I should use, then um, maybe it makes sense to not just define the git attributes file, but also inside it, tell git, hey, um, this is not uh, of use to anyone who's downloading the zip file, for example. It's just for the development version. OK, now we come to the major uh, part of the tools here. So PHP code sniffer. Um, PHP code sniffer is a tool. It's a command line tool that detects violations of the coding standards that you feed them, uh, the, the feed the tool. Um, actually, it's not only working for PHP, but also for JavaScript and CSS. 
but in the WordPress context, we're only using it for PHP, and in my opinion, it's uh, the, the most uh, natural thing to do because this is how it started, and in my opinion, there are far better tools for either JavaScript or CSS or Zas or whatever. Um, this is the main coding standards related tool for WordPress or for PHP. And um, the code sniffer understands certain set of standards. So a standard, as we had before, is a collection of predefined rules. Um, they are built in standards, so if you just download or however um, you want to take it, um, the thing so you can clone the Git repository or whatever, so if you somehow manage to get the code sniffer tool, you already have some standards. For example, the peer standard, you have PSR2, you have a Zen specific thing, so this is what the Zen framework follows, and uh, some more. Then there are WordPress standards. Um, there is one global God standard that basically gives you everything that's there. And then there are more finer um, granular things. And then these things are just being used by the WordPress global standard. So there are <coughs> standards just for WordPress core. Then there is a standard for the WordPress VIP. So um, there go into account things like uh, what happens if you have an enterprise high um, traffic, large site, multi-site network, whatever, um, specific security related things and so on. And there are others. For example, there is one for documentation and things like that. And there are other, so there are lots of um, code sniffer standards, but other standards that, in my opinion, make use for our context here. One is the PHP compatibility. This has been mentioned, I think, uh, once yesterday at the Contributor Day, once today at the GDPR talk, maybe. Um, there is a security related PHP. PHP specific, not WordPress specific standard or set of rules. Um, there is a Neutron standard, which is um, currently new. It's, by, um, it's created and maintained by Automatic. This is um, if you happen to write PHP 7 and beyond code. Um, there are specific uh, rules in there uh, and much more. So this is a very simple rule set file. So it's an XML file. Uh, you define your rule set, give it a name, and then you can do lots of things in there. So in this example, I include some file paths. So it's um, for a plugin. So I have a source folder, and I want to target everything inside there. And then also I have an index.php file because I just, yeah, it's just my plugin, main plugin file. It could also be WooCommerce, PHP, whatever. And I have an uninstalled PHP file. And then I reference two rule sets the PHP compatibility, and the whole WordPress thing. Of course, you have to install them as dependencies of your project, and then you can use them. Um, you can also include or exclude specific things. You don't have to include a whole rule set, a whole standard. So what you can do here is um, I take the WordPress standard, but I don't want the VIP. Um, this is easier for me than including the WordPress core, the WordPress documentation, the WordPress best practices, the WordPress style, or whatever. Just telling, hey, give me everything except for the VIP part. I don't need it. I don't want it. Um, or I can import the naming conventions valid hook name um, entity. It's, it's a sniff specific thing. Um, and I can customize it. So for example, um, the built-in configuration says, hey, you can only use alphanumeric characters and the underscore. So this is how WordPress says how your action and filter, so the hook names, have to look. But what if I want to have a dot in there? Like I have my awesome plugin, dot, and then the action name. I can configure PHP um, uh, code sniffer to understand and accept that. So I just say, OK, I take the sniff, but I want to also allow the dot as, an, as a word delimiter. Um, what you can also do, oh, this is a bit large. Um, what you can also do is, at the bottom, you reference a local file. So this is the rule set that we saw before. So I just take whatever I have in there, and then I um, configure additional things. So for example, I want to cache, when I use this rule set, the results. So PHP CS tries to see if there were, were any changes on the files since the last one. If not, you just get served the cached result. And also, I want to specify some command line arguments, like 
um, I want to have the full report. This is just uh, one of the available reports. Uh, I want to have the full report and store it in report full txt. I want to have the source specific report and I want to have a summary like I found 42 um, security specific violations and I found um, 20 style specific violations and so on. How to use it? Um, it's a command line tool, so you use it in a command line. <coughs> but you can also um, not only use it locally, but on your CI, if you have continuous integration server, so um, Travis or Circle CI or whatever. Um, you can use for reporting, which is just checking for violations, the PHP CS command. But there's also some um, nice thing, it's auto-fixing. So the project itself does not only have a single binary, the PHP CS, but it also has the PHP, I think it's code beautifier uh, binary, which um, for a certain amount of the code sniffs is able to automatically fix them. So if you have um, the rule set, hey, I want to have um, spaces around my array keys. Um, this is a simple thing. If there are no spaces, or if there maybe are three spaces before the key, um, this tool can fix that. Um, you can easily integrate this into your IDE. So PHP Storm, for example, I'm sure Atom and Sublime, I don't know, um, are able to somehow interact with that. So you don't have to use it from the command line, but make, uh, make use of it in the user interface of your IDE. Uh, what if you want to select or disable things here? So you have the standards, and you don't want to exclude a rule completely, but for specific files or for specific parts in your files. You can do that with comments. So you have the P, um, PHP CS ignore, which means just uh, the next line will not be um, checked. Uh, you can disable the, um, the, the tool. So as soon as this command or this um, comment gets, uh, yeah, um, the, as soon as the tool reads this command, it doesn't report anything uh, until the file ends or until you find the enable command again. And you can just say, hey, ignore this file, which basically means uh, it's shorter than disable at the top and don't uh, enable or whatever. Um, but you can also pass either standard names or sniffs. So I can say I want to ignore in the next line, this is only, the whole WordPress related sniffs. Or I want to disable just the um, CSRF specific sniffs. As I said, we don't have only PHP, we also have JavaScript. And for JavaScript, there was JS hint, there was JS lint, there was JS CS, and yeah, the future, and for uh, at least two years or so, is ES lint. ES lint is quite similar to PHP CS for the JavaScript um, ecosystem. So it's a linting utility, so it um, statically analyzes your code and tells you if it um, adheres to your standards or not. Uh, it understands JavaScript, but also JSX, which uh, is some new syntax um, which was introduced with React. Um, it's highly configurable, so you can configure the whole tool, you config can configure certain um, things, you can configure some um, parts of the tool via the command line, so um, with flags and so on. Um, and it also comes with optional autofix capabilities. Um, the rules that are available, so, so this is the set of categories for rules that come with the tool itself. So um, you have possible errors, you have best practices, and so on, and you can decide what categories you want to use and what individual rules you want to use. This is a possible configuration file. This uh, is a JSON file. Uh, so you have some configuration at the top. Then you have some plugins, maybe. A plugins extend the functionality. It could mean um, they introduce new rules. It could mean they introduce new processing capabilities, like. Um, generating the output um, or something else. And then you have the rules. So in this example, um, I'm importing, uh, I'm, I'm using the import plugin and I'm using the ik ik ik, which is um, the triple equal sign comparison. Um, and so my rule set only consists of two rules one built in in ESLint and one comes with this import plugin that I'm using. So how do you use this? 
ESLint is um, also a command line tool, so you just call ESLint. It has lots of arguments that you can um, yeah, just use certain things or just run it on certain files or whatever. Um, and if you want to make it autofix, um, the make use of its autofix um, functionality, then you have to specify that. So by default, it just lints, it just reports and tells you, hey, uh, this is what I found, or nothing. And um, similar to PHP CS, you can disable certain things. It's looking uh, pretty similar, so you have ESLint disable, you have enable, you have disable for that line, which means um, either if it's put in the same line, then it's for the next line, I think, or it's really you have to put on the end of the line. Um, okay, here are um, dedicated for next line and line. And um, similar to PHP CS, you can not only disable the tool, but disable certain rules, which, uh, yeah, sometimes might be useful or you have to. Um, for WordPress, there is a configuration. So it is based on some of the things that are available in uh, ESLint. And so they, um, the maintainers of this um, config um, package just, they picked what makes sense and maybe even added things, I don't know. Um, so you can just extend the WordPress thing and configure how you want to use it. Um, another thing is prettier. Um, Prettier, um, I think you know, if you know Prettier, you know it from the JavaScript ecosystem. But I learned just this week that it can also understand um, CSS and other formats like JSON and uh, I don't know what else. So um, the, the project page describes this as an opinionated um, code formatter. Opinionated here means uh, you cannot configure it that well as other things. It's, it's more fitting to WordPress like decisions and options. Um, PHP actually is a work in progress, so the Prettier project will be in some weeks, months uh, or so able to work on PHP files. Uh, and is it being used in the WordPress context? Uh, not yet. Um, but if you tried that and failed or thought about trying that or so, uh, reach out to these guys on Twitter. So um, <coughs> these are just three uh, of uh, them, of who I know um, who tried that. Um, and what's important here is you can use Prettier together with ESLint. So you can make use of certain things in Prettier because it works differently and allows some things that ESLint does not. And ESLint is able to um, yeah, do some things out of the box that Prettier does not. And ESLint is highly configurable. So everything that none of the tools um, offers you out of the box, you can make uh, ESLint do for you. And uh, if you introduce new rules, you might as well be able to um, implement the autofix functionality. So the lessons learned, I do hope. Um, coding standards are great. If you want to use them, just do. If you want to adapt or customize them, just do. This is what they are for. You don't have to take a standard and use it. It's like uh, all or nothing. Um, you can take a standard. You can combine different standards. You can just cherry pick the things that make sense for you. And um, maybe even uh, yeah, come up with your own coding conventions. And who knows, uh, they might become standards in a certain um, tech field. Um, maybe you heard that there was this largest patch in the history of WordPress last year. Uh, I don't know when it was, October, November, something like that. So um, the WordPress coding standards actually did get applied to the code base. A lot of things were able to get auto-fixed, but there are lots of things um, that have to be fixed manually. So if you have a rainy afternoon, don't know what to do, uh, just run PHP CBF and Pick one of the files uh, with uh, yeah, violations and <coughs> fix that. Create a patch and uploads. Um, lots of people will be happy. I think there were 3,000 open issues, uh, not issues like uh, open violations. Um, yeah. Uh, a tiny thing, um, tight got also mentioned yesterday and today. So tight. Why is all of this important? Because. Now, it's not only you who can make use of coding standards and tools that yeah, just tell you if you adhere to the standards or maybe automatically fix them. Now, with Tide, there's some other instance that is doing this on your code. 
So if you happen to have a plugin or a theme on the WordPress.org directory, um, currently, I'm, I'm not sure, I think currently they get only checked for PHP compatibility, but I'm sure in the near future they will also get checked against the WordPress best practices and so on. And maybe um, even they will report the authors, uh, like send an email, hey, we found this and so on. So if you don't know about this, um, maybe you know now. So uh, what you can do is make, make use of the tools on your own or if you don't want to do this, but you are following some kind of standard, just create or try to create the standard file because then Tight will use that. And it just makes, it doesn't make sense if you decide, hey, I want to do things this, uh, this way, and then Tight would tell you, um, yeah, but you're doing things wrong. Because if you put a configuration file in there, then Tight reads it and says, okay, this is what you want your code to look like, and it does look like that. If it does not find anything, it falls back to the WordPress coding standards, uh, and yeah, you can just prevent that. This was it from my side. If you have any questions, just uh, ask me now or find me later, maybe at the TV or wherever. Thank you for your attention. Skip escaping, for example, yeah. So the the, Sorry, the question can you was the yeah the question was um, there are ways to disable certain things both for ESLint the JavaScript linter and PHP CS the, PH, uh, the PHP specific one. The question is where to look it up and um, how to use that. So for the built-in rules both for ESLint and PHP CF, the um, original um, documentation, uh, the documentations are awesome. They are extensive. They both come with lots of practical examples and not just text. <coughs> so you have tiny uh, things addressed as text or explained as text and then addressed in some config example or code example. Um, it happens. Uh, so it, it depends on what you want to enable or disable. Is it something built in? Then you find that in the official documentation. So you will, of course, find the command or the technique, like it's eslint-disable, something like that. And if you want to target a specific rule or sniff or code or so, you have to know what this is. Um, for PHP uh, code sniffer, PHP CS, you can um, pass, I think it is, um, S as an argument, so if you call phpcs-s, it will include the error code, so the, the name of the sniff in all of the reports. So then you know, okay, I want to disable this. For ESLint, I don't know. Um, but the official documentation is really great. Thank you very much for your talk. And it was a pleasure. A WordPress onward gift. Oh. And big applause to you. Thank you. Thank you.